surrender Get the offender On the outside, on the flip side Not forever, be on I'm Nick from Bridge City Sessions. I've got Yotam Ben Horan from Haifa, Israel. Hey, how's it going, Hello. dude? Good. How are you? I'm doing good. It's a uh, 10:30 a.m. over here. What time is it over there? Like 8:30? 8, 8, 8:40. So I'm guessing it's 10:40 for you, right? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I man, <laughs> I'm getting minutes, my. Uh getting my times all mixed up it's weird yeah. i haven't gotten up this early uh to do one of these interviews it's usually you know later in the afternoon but uh this is like regular show time for you like this is when you would actually be performing like normal. yeah totally i either go on instagram or facebook i i try to you know not overdo it but i don't know if there's a thing as overdoing it like yeah because because due to the situation, so yeah. one day yes, one day no, two days no, three days yes. <laughs> yeah. So how's it been going in lockdown? Are you uh, working at all? Are you just staying home? And I've been actually uh, productive as hell, like uh, very creative. I, I taught myself how to play keyboards. I mean, I'm not great, but I, I, I got the idea of it and I practice every day. Uh, I, I'm doing these lives. I'm doing these like lyric canvases where mm -hmm. I, I write songs I've written. I write it on like a canvas and people uh, order it and just been, you know, also probably like you trying to keep fit as much mm -hmm. as I can Yeah. and uh, drink a lot of water. So it, it's been actually pretty good. It's been a good like uh, zoom out on life and on everything that was supposed to be during this time mm -hmm. and the biggest bummer is that um I'm, I'm separated at the moment from my girlfriend she's in italy and so i'm i'm actually waiting to see her more than anything yeah i can imagine um yeah so so what happened you you're in italy and you had to go home and she i mean how did what was the separation about well, I got back from Thailand, uh, like after the useless ID tour in Japan, I was in Thailand for, I don't know, like two weeks. Mm -hmm. And then things started getting heavy in Israel and in Thailand, it, it's kind of like the Corona thing kind of started. Like I was wearing masks every time I, I left the, the place I was staying at. But once, once I got back to Israel, uh, there was this rule that whoever comes from abroad and in Thailand as well, Japan, mm -hmm. China, needs to stay in quarantine for 14 days. And then uh, my girlfriend joined as well. And then they said, whoever comes from Italy needs to, so we're, we're both like, um, fuck this, we're out of here. So I flew yeah. with her to Italy yeah. and I was there like five days. Uh, I was with her f for five days. And then my parents called me up and they said uh, that I, I better get the hell out of there because they're, they're going for a lockdown. They're going to do a lockdown in like a day. And they're, they're stopping all the transportation and uh, ah. the, the flights are getting canceled. So I booked us both a ticket uh, last minute. We, we, were, we, we had like this little trip we wanted to do. We were supposed to be in Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. So uh, once we got to the airport, I got, we got there with the flight tickets that I, I just bought. And they let me on the flight and uh, they stopped her at the, at the front desk. They said, hey, you have an Italian passport. You have to stay. You can't, you can't fly. So... Wow. Yeah, it, it was bad. Like, I mean, we were both crying and, and looking at each other. And I, I knew that this would take a while. Mm -hmm. And it, it, you know, now we're, you know, we're approaching the, the good news. But yeah. it's, it's been a rough two months. Like it took me, it took me quite a while to like, all right, I, I can't be in depression. I have to do mm -hmm. something. So I started doing these lives and it just became like a thing. Yeah, um, that's been really cool. I've been watching, uh, watching you go live all the time. And it's been nice because, <clears throat> you know, we can't see a lot of our friends and everybody just yeah. started uh, recording live streams. And it was just a, a good way to, you know, see what other people are doing. And uh, yeah, I've been tuning into a lot of those. Um, so outside of doing live streams, let's see, you've done, uh, you started a new project, uh, Decomposers. Tell me a little bit about that. Um, yeah, so so Decomposers is a production team. Mm -hmm. It's uh, well, uh, all right. I think pretty much since Fat Mike put me together with uh, John Kerry from Old Man Markley, to he said you two have to make a band together. You two have to make music together. Mm -hmm. So I was like, okay, let's try it. So he put us together. Me and Johnny totally hit it off. 
and uh, we've both known Mike forever. Mm -hmm. So uh, we kind of like became this like, uh, uh, like you know, I, I wouldn't say a trio, but we kind of, we, we started spending a lot of time together, the three of us. And Mike had been spending a lot of time with Baz, uh, the guy from France that's been working with him on, on no effects. And he did the musical. So I think in Mike's, Mike's brain, he wanted to put us all together because he really appreciates what we each can, uh, can give musically and, uh, mm -hmm. what we, we each offer something else, you know, like, uh, uh, I, I mean, Johnny and Baz, they're both great uh, studio engineers. Mm -hmm. I, I also do like some studio engineering. I could record demos at home, but that's not like my uh, strong, mm -hmm. strong spot. I'm very, you know, I, I could write a song like that. I'm, I mm -hmm. have melodies in my head all day. Yeah. Sometimes I have lyrics as well. Yeah. So, you know, we each, so, so Mike, he, he kind of like, you know, brainstorming and he's like, I want to make this a production team. Cause uh, we could we could do great things together. So he sent me off to uh, to do the Bomb Pops record. So I did the last Bomb Pops record. If you've heard it, uh, De Death in Venice Beach. And, okay, so you were uh, involved Johnny, in recording it. What's up? You were involved in recording. The yeah, latest? yeah, yeah. I produced oh, okay. it. Oh, it was uh, okay. it was Mike's doing. He he paired me up with them because uh, that that was kind of like the the spark of the whole uh, decomposers. Before it was called uh -huh. decomposers, it was called decom. It was oh, like, okay. you know, trying out names. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Mike had been working with Baz endlessly and also with Johnny. And, and then Mike and, ba uh, Mike and Johnny uh, started working on uh, the Bad Cop, Bad Cop record that's about to be released. Mm -hmm. And they started working on uh, Days and Days. So, uh, you know, Days and Days. I saw yeah. that they did a session. Mm -hmm. So it kind of like became a, a production team. And uh, as uh, we all know how to record ourselves pretty quick uh we had this uh, idea to record an album of jewish prayers and turn them into punk rock kind of like for fun uh -huh. and that came out great so mm -hmm. so it looks like decomposers is a band well yeah it kind was, of is yeah, yeah. so it, it's 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 a it's a thing <laughs> yeah i was kind of confused because I, I was looking up stuff and i see you know there's four guys in the picture and then there's a music video and and so I'm like, it says, you know, in the, in the bio that you guys are a production team, but then I also see that you guys are kind of like a band. So it was just kind of confusing at first. And so, yeah, I was just trying to get an idea of what was going on with that. <clears throat> yes. So, I mean, uh, the, the Chabad religion record, that's the, the Jewish prayer album that we did mm -hmm. into like bad religion type uh, punk rock mm -hmm. so that's actually all all each one of us playing his instrument Baz is on drums Mike is on bass me and Johnny guitar and I'm singing and they're doing backing so it's kind of like a band so mm -hmm. I don't know uh, where where it's headed it's pretty much the beginning but there's mm -hmm. a lot of stuff going on at the moment yeah. and uh, we're in touch on a weekly basis and you know brainstorming sharing ideas so yeah it's it's pretty interesting I've I've never been involved in something like this you know i'm just used to you know me i'm used to being on tour and just go mm -hmm. go 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 yeah so now it's kind of like uh taking a step back from touring and i think uh that that's what uh, uh fat mike he came out to see me a few times during those tours that i passed uh by uh even uh bridge city mm -hmm. and uh and at the, the, the last time i passed through he was like not not the last time i passed through you a time before that he was like, man, you shouldn't be on the road all the time. I, I mean, we could do great things together. And, and so I, I took it, his advice. I thought it was good. good ugh, I thought it was good advice. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. I'm making up my words here for dinner. <laughs> well, I mean, once you have, you know, your, your band thing for a while, you've had your solo um, projects going for a while. You've had useless ideas been out forever. I mean, y you've done all of that stuff. So, I could see why uh, you could, you know, take on a new, um, I don't know if that would be a career choice for you or just a new project, but that would definitely it's, it's be. It's just a different, I mean, I've, I've been on the road for like five years, almost five years straight. I, uh, I Frank Turnered myself on the road, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that, it, it, like uh, from, from all the singer songwriters, I, uh, Frank Turner, I, I think he's, he's on the road like all the time. So yeah. I, I, I kind of did the same. Mm -hmm. And I played all, I, and I enjoyed it. I'd enjoyed every minute of it. But, you know, to almost three years back, I met my girlfriend. And then mm -hmm. that started to be a thing. Like, uh, 
you know, you, at some point we want to live together, but I'm just like traveling all over the place. She's yeah. still studying uh, university. And so I think just taking a step back, I mean, it's not that I don't want to tour ever again. I do mm -hmm. want to tour, but yeah. I don't want, I just don't want to be on the road all the time because it mm -hmm. just drains everything. And it, it, it didn't, uh, I, I don't, I don't think like from the last, few tours I, I benefited as much as I did when I just started going out alone you know what I mean mm -hmm. yeah Cause, yeah because let's say for example with useless ID we we could do like a week and a half or we could do like a week in Japan and then we do like two weeks in Europe and that's great but mm -hmm. I don't think any any of us would want to be on the road for three months you know oh yeah yeah, yeah it's rough especially you know you, you get older you have families and you know girlfriends yeah. and kids you know it's like you can't you can't just, uh, you know, take off for that long. You got responsibilities at home and, you know, it's understandable. Of course. And, you know, it's, it's kind of like, uh, I, I want to experience, I guess, everything that life has to offer in that, mm -hmm. in that sense. So I've, I've never really experienced uh, a normal relationship. I mean, yeah. even the relationship I'm in now is, is kind of crazy because it's long distance. Mm -hmm. But when we're together, it's, it's like the best relationship I've ever had in my life. So I don't want to lose that. And uh, oh, yeah. she doesn't want to lose it either. So I want to see uh, what, what if I uh, put my energy into that? Because I've never done that. I've always mm -hmm. been on the road and I'm, I'm always used to, you know, being with the three, three or four dudes in a van and driving all over places. And I uh, yeah, you know, it's just a different perspective on on everything. So if you uh, if you had a chance to settle down, you know, kind of after after doing all this stuff, are, are you thinking that your home is going to stay in Israel, or were, were you thinking that maybe one day you would, you know, move to Italy, or what was? Yeah, I I mean, I don't feel like my home is Israel. I I feel like um, for the past few years, I kind of Israel is the place where I just kind of chill and say mm -hmm. hi to my mom and yeah. and hang out and i have like the whole setup here with all my records and this this is my brother's old room so i kind of took over i made it into a music room and it's such a mess <laughs> but um as far as living i i was trying to live in i, I was living in in the u.s for like almost i don't know four or five months four months mm -hmm. from since september and then uh, my visa was about to expire. So I thought, you know, just to get out and we had the useless ID tour in Japan. So I kind of like made everything. So I eventually come back, but then the whole Corona thing started. So I kind of yeah. made my move to the U.S. But now that uh, my girlfriend, Paula, she's uh, going to finish with her studies. So we want to we want to decide together what what we shall do. <laughs> yeah. Here, here gotcha. we go again. Yeah, well. Hopefully after the virus is, you know, everybody is all safe and, and people can be around each other. You guys can, uh, you know, reunite and, you know, carry on with your plans. And uh, yeah, of course. Yeah. I'm looking yeah. forward to it. Yeah. That'll be really exciting. Um, so aside from uh, decomposers, you've, you've got also another project, Tommy and June. And uh, why don't you tell me a little bit about that? Okay. So, uh, uh, one of the last times I played San Francisco, Fat Mike came out to see the show. I think I mentioned it before. And when I was done with my set, he came on stage and he told me, man, I, I got to produce your next record. I got to do something with you. you. You shouldn't be playing in front of 20 people. <laughs> so I said, OK. So I slept at, at his house. You know, we hung out and everything was cool. And then uh, my next flight was to Paris uh, to meet my girlfriend. So I flew to Paris a few days later, Fat Mike calls me and he says, okay, I got it. Uh, I'm not going to produce your record. I want to put you in touch with another singer songwriter that he's great. He has a great voice. And I think you two are going to make magic together. So I'm like, okay. So he tells me uh, about John Kerry and I, I knew old man Markley, but I wasn't familiar with Johnny. I've never met him. So I'm like, okay. And I'm looking over to Paula and I'm like, well, what do you think? He's like, uh, so she's like, you, you should go for it. I mean, you got nothing to lose. I'm like, okay. So, so um, Johnny recorded, uh, I didn't mention this before. Johnny recorded a, on, uh, a backing vocal on one of the voice memos I had sent to Mike and Mike sent it to me. And I thought it was kind of weird. You know, the harmonies were a bit off, but I, I could hear that Johnny had a good voice. And he's like, and Mike's like, uh, so you see, it's great, right? So you two could make a band together. 
And I'm like, uh, okay. <laughs> so uh, then, then Mike told me, never mind. Uh, go home, go back to Israel, uh, write a song every day, and be back here in a month in, in the U.S. So that's what I did. I went back home. I had this mission. Um, Mike uh, put this little, uh, uh, this, he planted a seed in my head that the whole idea of this, uh, Tommy, this band, which wasn't Tommy and June yet, would be uh, kind of close to my acoustic solo, but it would be like two, like uh, two people mm -hmm. singing, like Simon and Garfunkel yeah. meets like 77 punk. Like every once in a while, there would mm -hmm. be like a Ramones beat coming in and like punk rock. Mm -hmm. So I, I kind of knew like where I was headed with the writing. I tried to like not, uh, you know, when I'm just writing a solo record, I don't really think too much. I just like write what I, like my feelings and mm -hmm. my thoughts and whatever comes out. But over here, I, I was pretty much, uh, you know, dead set on, I had a vision. So when I came back to the, back to the U S Johnny picked me up from the airport. We went to his house. We, uh, we hit it off as friends right away. Like, uh, a lot of the mutual, uh, things that we, we both love and we got to work right away on demos. And uh, that, that's how the whole thing started. And we, eventually we'd, we'd let Mike hear what we were up to and he'd give his thoughts. We'd uh, decide which songs we would be working on, which songs would be left aside. And uh, we were calling it Lab Rats the whole time since uh, Johnny, who hasn't had a band for a while since uh, Old Man Markley broke up, he wanted to form like a hardcore band and called the Lab Rats. And he showed me like the cover. <laughs> It was yeah. like the lab rats taking out the trash or like throwing out the trash. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So I, I like the name. And uh, eventually uh, when I uh, came to the U.S., like a, I was like a year later already um, to, in my attempt to, to kind of stay there and try to live there. So I, I ended up uh, staying at uh, John and Annie's house. Uh, so I, I, on one of the days I was reading, uh, Gene Simmons book. He, he, he has this book about, uh, I forgot the name of it. It's, it's probably called growing rich or something like that or getting rich. <laughs> so he talks a lot about marketing and trademark and how much the name is important. So that got me thinking about the whole Yotam thing. And I'm like, uh, you know what? Maybe I, I shouldn't go Yotam on this album. Cause Johnny was already supposed to be like this mystery guy. Like, so he was June. So in the credits, it was written Lab Rats or Yotam in June. And I, I just thought of something. I was like, well, my name was Tommy when I was a little kid, when I was growing up in Brooklyn. So maybe I'll present that to Mike. And I came to Mike, uh, who was in, sitting in, in one of the rooms, and I say, well, what do you think if we write Lab Rats or Tommy in June? And then he looks over to me and he said, that's the name, Tommy in June. So that's uh, Mike being brilliant over there because <laughs> I, I didn't see that. So it seems like he's just got all these ideas for you and, you know, it's just kind of yeah. like, yo, Tom, hey, you should do this. You should do that. Um, do, do you guys have anything recorded yet? Or I, I, I know that oh. uh, when you With played Tommy over in June. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The album's out. Oh, OK. Uh, for some reason with all of the um the links and stuff that you post i just haven't come across it yet i've uh, oh yeah so it, it's it's everywhere it's on spotify and itunes and i think we actually have a, a good batch of songs for for the next tommy engine record i've been playing like on in my lives i've been trying out all these new songs and all yeah. these like uh older newer songs and people are digging most of them so i'm thinking i think we got we got the bunch here <laughs> yeah um when you i've booked you to um play some of your solo shows in Portland and I noticed uh, the last one that you did at the studio you played at least a, a tune or two from from Tommy and June um, yeah and I played yeah it's it's hard to to really tell the difference between your solo stuff and the stuff that you are uh, <clears throat> writing with Tommy and June it, it is that something that is just super close to your solo stuff and you're just adding another vocalist or you were saying that you're trying to focus on a different style with Tommy. Well, the, 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 the state of mind was different. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, with my solo stuff, the, my first solo record was kind of like a, a, a buildup. So, it, you know, it was kind of like, uh, just it's, it's very clear, not cliche, but many people have said it that your first record is like, you know, 
a kind of like a compilation of all the years you've kept certain songs. I have a song mm-hmm. from like 2003 on my first record and another song from like 2008. Yeah. And then the next record I've written actually came out of writing uh, Useless IDs album, State is Burning. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I had all these songs that were kind of folkier. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that's what became California Sounds. Because I, I just like took the bunch of those songs. I played them on the road for two mm-hmm. months straight. Went into a studio, recorded it in two days, called it an album. The next one, uh, I, I, I was still on the road. And would, uh, that was the album that I would do with Joey Cape. So I was writing on the road. I was trying to write a song a day. And that lasted two weeks. After two weeks, I was like, all right, enough. <laughs> But, but some of those songs made, made, made the cut. It's weird. It's weird how, like, you know, you could sit at home and, like, uh, overthink things and, like, okay, what am I going to write a song about? And then you're sitting, like, in the middle of, like, Fayetteville, Arkansas, or whatever that place is called, and you have, like, 10 minutes before you go on stage, you go into the car and you write the song The Good Son. So I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's like that. I'll, I'll uh, be doing something and something will just pop in my head and I'll just run over and play my guitar real quick. And, yeah. And, and it's you know, crazy it how little, it works. Such a mystery. Yeah. So um, how was uh, doing the one week recording? I, I've seen a lot of artists do that and I haven't really talked to anybody that has worked with Joey. Um, you know, what's that experience like? Well, it's an interesting experience. I mean, he's, he, he's a, Joey's a very interesting person. He's very involved like at the time when I was writing for the album and I was sending him demos, he would, he would get back to me every once in a while and say, yeah, I got the songs, I got the songs. But then when, you know, when it was like, I don't know, like two weeks before recording, he, he, he would listen to the songs like crazy and send me notes and like really be involved in it. Mm-hmm. And, then, and then he'd narrow the, 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 the songs he'd want to record. So he showed me, he showed me one day uh, this list of songs and I thought six of them were not good, my good songs, but he proved me wrong. (laughs) Cause yeah. yeah, Okay. So think about it this way. You have one week to record your album. Mm -hmm. I'm used to recording quick. I'm like, Mm -hmm. I I try to be as rehearsed as I can when going to the studio, even if you know, there's going to be a million changes like we do at the blasting room. But with uh, Joey, I mean like a song like backyard, uh, he, we, he was telling me, uh, let's, let's, let's check the guitar sound real quick. Can you play a run through of backyard? So I played backyard one time through and then he says, all right, we got it. And I'm like, what do we got? He got, we got the guitar take. You, you want to do some vocals? I'm like, I, uh, I don't even know if it's the right tempo. And then he's like, Dude, we got it. <laughs> so, so there was a lot of, uh, you know, new things that I, I wasn't used to, but eventually it was it was a it was an interesting experience it, it was I, I i think it was hard in a way because he would uh he, he'd kind of like really get into your lyrics and like uh he's he, joey would ask me why are you singing this line what what do you mean and then i i tell him what i mean and he goes well you can say it this way too and you know he was like very involved so the the one week uh, experience is is very uh, what's the word here? Well, I'm at a loss for words. <laughs> it's, it's very, uh, uh, not, not preserved, but, but you get the idea. You get what, the yeah. idea of what I'm talking about. It's, you know, you have this, this certain amount of time to do this. And I did 12 songs. Normally they do 10 songs, but since my songs were short, mm-hmm. so yeah, it was, it was, uh, it was a good experience. Do you think, uh, um, you learned, from him kind of helping to produce you? Do, do you think any of that stuff kind of applies to how you write songs now? Or was that just... Uh, yeah, I, just I like... think any experience you go through mm-hmm. uh, applies to what I write. I mean, even even working with, with Fat Mike on several things, <clears throat> it kind of like, I, you know, uh, Fat Mike could sing, could sit in, in front of the TV, watch just watch a, a show for, for an hour. Then he comes out, I just wrote a new song. And like, uh, how? Because the, the show it, it, uh, inspired him to write about a certain other thing. And I'm like, that, that's, that's inspiring, you know? Yeah. I, I mean, I used to do that. Uh, there's a bunch of tricks. But yeah, so from Joey, from Fat Mike, from Bill Stevenson, from Jason Livermore, I always pick out something from these people. And uh, yeah, with, with Joey, for sure. Um, I, I think 
I think two years ago, I would be more like a, in the headspace where I, I would actually tell you what it is I, I picked up from, from him. But I mean, I do love the guitar sounds. He always gets this like uh, crispy guitar sound in his studio. I think mm -hmm. it's just like his uh, default. And, um, and the, the one thing is that making an album with him is kind of like before we started recording, he's like, I hope you're ready. Cause, cause we're making your, your, you, you, kind of like your Joey Yotam album. So yeah. I'm going to say a lot of things that, you know, may, may not seem right to you, but, but try to bear with me. And that's a, you know, you're kind of like putting your ego on the side, your songwriter mm -hmm. ego on the side. And you're like, yeah. okay, let's do something else with Joey now. And, uh, I like the record. I, I rediscovered it now. I, I'm playing so many songs off that record. I think uh, we worked on, um, a vi we did a music video. I oh, think yeah. It's something that you recorded um, on that record. And I think what, that was Slip. Slip, yeah. I love the video we did. So cool. Yeah, it was. Uh, we were uh, walking around Portland. Um, I booked you a show that night. And uh, yeah. I wonder, is that the weird one where you got put on a mixed bill? Or was that like a actual, like, because I remember there was a, I booked you in Portland and there, and it was double booked and you oh, had yeah. to play, you had to play show, a uh, show with like a ska band and a hardcore band. And then it was, Yo probably, Tom. I think, I think that was the one. Yeah. It was, it was such a weird bill because, uh, Oh, you know what? No, no, no. I think it was one time after that. Oh yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about it in terms of the length of my hair. Cause when we did slip, it was kind of like a bit longer than this, but the next yeah. time I came through, I had like the full on whatever. Yeah. <laughs> the metal. So, uh, what's with the blonde? Is that, is that your, like, uh, just it's the natural hair color. You can't see that. <laughs> see, I, see, I was going to go there, but I was like, there's no way. There's no, no, way. no, no. Uh, my girlfriend, Paula, she's blonde yeah. and she's been, she's been nudging me, not, not nudging me, but she's been uh, like telling me, I really want to see you blonde one day. <laughs> and, and then I told her, okay, you know what? Fine. So, so when I was in Italy before this whole Corona lockdown, uh -huh. I decided to get like a, get a bit of a haircut cause my hair was a mess after tour. But mm -hmm. the thing is before the useless ID tour, I dyed it like pitch black. It was so dark. So I had to sit on that chair for like an hour and a half till they got this out of me. So, yeah. so yeah, so now we're like, we're like two blondes in a way. <laughs> and, and you know what? I dig it. I mean, I haven't done this since like age 15 or so, 20 maybe. So it's been yeah. a while. Yeah, it makes me think of like a younger Yotam who who used to experiment with hair color and stuff. Yeah, uh, I, I try not to do that. I mean, most of the hair underneath this is gray. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I don't know. It seemed like a fun idea. I like it. Yeah, I man, I can't even remember the last time I dyed my hair. I just, I don't know. It just doesn't, I just... Uh, as, as punk as I like to think that I am sometimes, I just can't pull off just that aesthetic, so I don't even mess with it. Me neither, but look at me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you actually look cool. You, you, fit, you fit the role. You've been a punk rocker. Thank you. It, ma it makes these shirts look good with the hair. Yeah. <laughs> so, man, you've been doing this a long time. So you started, you joined Useless ID, I want to say, what, in the early 90s? Or was yeah. it the late 90s? No, I joined them for two shows in 1996 because their bass player joined the army. And mm -hmm. I had one more year of high school to do, which I failed miserably. <laughs> uh, so I, I couldn't come on tour with them. And that was the first tour they would do. That was in 96, um, I think after the summer, like 96 into 97. So the, actually the original guitar player rejoined and did the tour with them. But mm -hmm. once they got back from the tour, he stayed with them for like another month. And then the bass spot was vacant again. So I'm like, oh, I'll take it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so I think you could say from 97. 97. And yeah. when you first joined, uh, was that still like on the bands? Like you guys had your own label, like Falafel Records or is that? Yeah, yeah. Is that still going or is that just? No, uh, there were a few releases, I think maybe five or something. And mm -hmm. it was yeah, it was kind of useless IDs label. Uh, mm -hmm. Guy and Ishai were uh, they, they were the guys. Yeah, they they, they were the ones kind of like running the show on that. But um, yeah, I, I mean, like for the longest time, I was I was pretty pretty 
pretty passive in my uh, input to the band. I was like, mm-hmm. I joined in as a bass player and I would do the occasional scream here and there. Yeah. So it, it took a, it took a few years till I um, brought up a bunch of songs and uh, they were like, Oh, maybe you should try singing them because they're very personal. So, so you weren't the lead singer when you first joined? No, no. I, I was just the bass player. And I, and I, I was actually fine with that role because mm-hmm. uh, I've always had these other bands where I like hardcore bands and that where I, I was the lead singer or, mm-hmm. you know, like Gorilla Biscuits type bands where I'll just scream and mm-hmm. all and like, so that was fine for me. So yeah, use the idea. I'll play bass. So uh, after you joined for a while, you guys ended up uh, hooking up with Kung Fu Records. Yeah, uh, that was. Uh, I I just it's funny you mention it because I just ha- had Chris Rowe on my Instagram and we brought up all these memories. Mm-hmm. So that's actually Chris Chris Rowe's doing. He he opened the he opened the gate uh, for Useless ID uh, in the U.S. So we, we, we had two shows booked for the same day, one at the Old Ironsides in Sacramento and one at the Cocadri in San Francisco. I think they're like two hours apart, two hours and a half. So we were in a hurry. And once we got there, and I, we knew the Ataris were playing and we all already had liked them. So once we got there, we saw the, like the list of bands outside and the Atari's name was crossed out. And I'm telling the guys, shit, we missed them. So we're getting out of the van and then this like blonde uh, spiky dude uh, comes out hold like you know carrying his amp and i'm like hey dude the, the, the ataris play yet and he goes yeah we did i am the ataris nice to meet you chris <laughs> and uh, then uh yeah and that that was like my first uh encounter with him so we we exchanged uh phone numbers and uh, he gave us a recording that just made and we gave them i think a cassette our first cd like our, our recording and and Chris got back to us after a while that he really, you know, he, he really appreciated that we're coming from Israel to tour the U.S., you know, because that, that was kind of unheard of back in the day, that a DIY, yeah. DIY punk band. Because mm-hmm. for, for like successful uh, mainstream Israeli artists, this is the funny thing. A tour is always like four shows. It's like New York, Los Angeles, <laughs> you know, like all, yeah. like these Bam, 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 these like four dots on the map like spread out in the whole u.s and i'm like that's not a fucking tour a yeah. tour is getting in the van and going for two months and like you know sleeping on floors mm-hmm. so he really appreciated that that that's what we were doing and he, he told me that and you guys sounded great i, I really like the songs so i wanted to help you guys out and i spoke to joe from uh, the vandals and i told him uh, i, I want to do a split uh, cd with with useless id so that's how it kind of started the split cd with the ataris Oh, that's pretty cool. Uh, so, but Chris isn't really like um, running the label. He's just kind of like a guy. No, uh, he, that, he was the kid. He was the kid that was handing out demos at shows to to people. So, you know, eventually in one of his handouts, he handed it to Joe from the Vandals because he, gotcha. he heard that Joe opened the la- had just opened mm-hmm. the label called Kung Fu Records. So he was like, hey, you know, just gave him, gave him the cassette. And I think... Uh, Joe really liked it and he goes, all right, so let's do something with you guys. And then he realized that the band is only Chris. So he, he put, uh, he got, he got Derek from Lagwagon to, to be the drummer and he kind of put the band together for Chris or mm. something like that. So, yeah. So, so, so I, at some point I think when the Atari started, uh, you know, breaking out. So Chris kind of became like this, uh, kind of like this voice in the label where mm-hmm. uh, you know new signings so chris will produce you so we you know antifreeze there was a band called antifreeze so chris produced them and uh and they recorded it at orange whip and when i heard it i'm like oh man this sounds great it sounds kind of like the ataris blue mm-hmm. skies so when it was time for us to make a, a record for kung fu records so it, it was an obvious choice that we'd go with chris since uh, we love the ataris and you know they were just blasting at the time they were doing great so i we we thought on all aspects it would be good for everyone so how many full lengths did you actually you put out a couple full lengths on kung fu or uh when did you make the move over to fat yeah so we put we put out that split and then another three albums three full albums so our last last one for kung fu was redemption okay 
So it was like bad story, no vacation from the world and redemption and mm -hmm. the split CD. So it's kind of like four, like three and a half albums. Yeah. And then uh, once we were released from the, from the Kung Fu contract, we said we recorded um, the lost broken bones. We sent it to fat records. And I, uh, from what I remember, I think Mike liked it, but, but the, the office was okay with it. They were like, eh, it's all right. So, and I, I mean, with Fat Records, you need everyone to be super excited about because they're going to be working the album when it, when, it, if, when it comes out. So if they're not yeah. excited, what, what are you going to do, right? Yeah. So, so we just decided to release it on like five different labels. It was so scattered. And by, by the next album, uh, Symptoms, which is, uh, interestingly enough, it's our slowest record. It's like a rock record as far as I'm concerned. It's not really punk. It's like, you know, all the songs are super personal and many people told me that it's their favorite useless ID record, but it's hard to pull off these, the songs live because, you know, they're like three and a half minutes long, four minutes, and a useless ID show, we just, in a way, it's kind of like a Descendants show. You play like two minutes, two minutes, one minute, two minutes, two minutes, break, yeah. one minute, two minutes, you know? Yeah. It's kind of like a, like a Ramones thing in a way, which we realized is, is, transmits our energy as best as possible because we're not, you know, we're not a rock band. So uh, when, we, when we were done with that album, uh, we spoke to Bill and we said, hey, you, you mind talking to Fat Mike again <laughs> for us? <laughs> so, so Bill did. Uh, Bill spoke to Fat Mike. Uh, also, um, uh, Brandon from uh, Teenage Ball Rocket, he was a good buddy. And uh, yeah, we're, we're sad that he's gone. So he, yeah, so, you know, I think they were both sitting on Mike and, and eventually Mike's like, yeah, you know what, fuck it. Yeah, I, I like this record. And, uh, and, and the, the next record we did, uh, Status Burning, I think that, that was the record that was supposed to be on Fat. <laughs> so, so that record, um, Symptoms, was just kind of like a record to, to kind of get yourself in the door. And then when you got in the door, you recorded State is Burning. And, yeah. Uh, and so is that one you did with The Blasting Room? Yeah, that's another one we did with the Blasting Room. And after Symptoms, we, we realized that live, we, we only play like two songs from that record. And two, then the two songs went down to one. Mm -hmm. And we're like, okay, we, we can make another slow record. This is like, you know, it's Lost Broken Bones was slow. And this one was even slower in a way. So we decided, you know what, how about we just go back? I mean, we spoke about it and then that's what I did. I'm like, well, why did I fall in love with punk rock? Why did I fall in love with melodic punk? Well, what was it? Mm -hmm. What was, what was it that drew me into this music, you know, in the first place? Because eventually <laughs> we ended up making a, a, a slow, a heavy rock album. Yeah. So I, I listened to Bad Religion Suffer. I listened to Gorilla Biscuits. I listened to, like, your shirt, Propaganda. I listened to Lagwagon, No Use for a Name, No Effects. I, I got, like, surrounded by that, like, obsessively. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, now it's time to write a record, you know? So, but it's interesting. Uh, we... We, we, I started writing the album and the songs that were coming were just weren't good, you know? And then, and then I decided, all right, fuck it. I'm going on tour. And I, I left Israel for like a half a year and did my whole California sounds experience uh, all over the U S when I came back, uh, we, I think we had already booked studio time and there were like uh, se several songs already. But my state of mind was different already. I, I'm like, or, you know, I had this like new experience in my life. Mm -hmm. So I kind of knew uh, what to add into the mix to make it a great album and not just, you know, like a bunch, a bunch of songs. You know? It's hard to uh, imagine that you had songs for that record that weren't good because every single song on that record, I like from the moment you started, it's just the energy on it. And Thank you know, you. It's, it's got like a you know, it's fast. It's, you know, there's some short songs and, um, it just seems like, uh, just really well written and, um, it's got kind of a political theme to it. And, uh, you know, when you went into writing that was, uh, any of the experiences of, you know, the state of things and how life is right now that really helped you write lyrics for that? Or like, what made you go with the theme state is burning? Uh, yeah. Uh, well, well, State is Burning was originally a, a song I wrote. 
Okay. And I was kind of like, uh, this, this, this happens sometimes to, to artists. You write a song and you're, the subconscious is working. The back of your mind is working. It's all like, you know, wired and it's coming out on paper. And then I read the lyrics and I'm like, holy shit, this is like so not my style to write, you know, that the state is burning and why it's burning and why I'm pissed off. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I actually let my dad read the lyrics and he, he told me, do not release this song. <laughs> and I'm like, all right, cool. I will release this song. <laughs> so so I, I had that song before I went on my little venture and that kind of set the tone for the whole thing. Because I, I knew for the longest time, like, for example, uh, a guy from Useless ID, he's very involved politically. He always knows what's going on on the news. He always knows, like, you know, Bibi Netanyahu and all that stuff. And, like, he, he's, he's aware of it. So he, he, was, he was, like, dying for the longest time that we'd have some politics in our music because I was just writing about, you know, my personal stuff. And I, I, I am the main writer. Yeah. But but uh once that that whole thing opened up with state is burning i tried to you know kind of like uh le- abandon my my feelings for a while i'm like okay i could write about that stuff for my solo record whatever i'll, I'll leave that on the side so i, I just started you know eh, i wouldn't say uh, be interested and I, I i wasn't really like watching the news but i was aware of it on my feet all the time mm-hmm. So it kind of made its way into the lyrics because that, that's where my head was at at the time. But I don't think I'm going to make another record like that because I'm, I'm, I'm not a political guy. I'm, I, I'm just not. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's hard to, um, you know, when you, when you get political like that, you can, you can definitely uh, set that theme for your band really quick, you know. Yeah. And, and um, you know, I don't think you guys are trying to be like anti-flag. You know, no, it's, no. It's, I mean, it, I don't have a problem with what Anti Flag is doing. Oh, I mean, good totally on them. Not. They, uh, it, it's, it's their thing. You know, that mm-hmm. that's what yeah. what Anti Flag is. With Useless yeah. ID, I, I think with us, it's like every every album we released, we're like, okay, what could we do now? And and it'll still sound like us, as long as the songs are great. That that's what we always, uh, you know. I've tried a few times to have like a vision for an album, mm-hmm. but that always goes to hell because, you know, some songs for that specific vision. I mean, when you have that vision, it kind of, in a way it could close you up. Let's say for Tommy and June, it didn't. It had the opposite effect because I was coming, I was coming to Tommy and June from scratch. I was like, I, I could do whatever I want. And I could imagine this, you know, Simon and Garfunkel thing playing with like a 77 punk band. And, you know, I, we don't, I don't have like this, I don't have eight albums to look back at and say, oh, this is not in the style of that. But uh, with, with Useless ID, it's kind of like uh, we have to leave all antennas open, but it, ha- it, has to, it still has to be under this like punk rock window because we're a punk band. Oh, shit, I got stuck again, huh? We could always try to branch out into like certain styles and certain inspirations in music, but it's always going to, at the end of the day, we're a punk band or a melodic hardcore band or melodic punk band or whatever you want to call it. And we're under that label. I mean, we, we can't come out with a record that sounds like queen or something all of a sudden. (laughs) Yeah. That's going to be like, what the fuck is wrong with you guys? And I, I wouldn't want that either. I mean, I, the four of us like playing punk rock together. We don't like playing grunge. Um, so it's, so with that record is what really, you know, I, I had heard useless idea. I want to say, I had a comp short music for short people a long time ago. I was in high school and uh, I want to say maybe there was a useless ID song on there with like no effects and descendants. Um, and I, I want to say I heard that name for years, but didn't really, it didn't really come across my feed in a way where um, I really grabbed onto me. And then, so you guys booked, uh, I booked you guys for a session. Um, yeah. It was like a a day before you started your tour with no effects. I believe uh, yeah. the guys the guys uh, flew like twenty hours straight to the studio. Yeah, that was I so think wild. You, I think you were already here. Uh, yeah, like, I was at uh, Corbett's house. Yeah, so you were yeah, already Corbett here. Corbett and Monica. So, so yeah. you're already uh, uh, you know acclimated to you know just being here. And the other guys flew twenty hours straight to the studio. I think we did our session at like 
nine at night or something like that. And uh, yeah, I, I think I was struggling with some voice issues too that day for some reason, right? I was like coming off a of sickness. Yeah, no, I remember, yeah, your voice cracked a couple of times. You were sick, but uh, there was only like one song where you could really notice it. And unfortunately that yeah. was Night Shift. So we wouldn't, mm. we, we weren't able to uh, release that one. But uh, man, I just remembered after, you know, them flying there and uh, just the drummer and just everybody was just like right on point. It was such a good yeah. performance. And uh, you guys yeah, that, called it. That, that's how it is. I mean, we could not meet for like a few months and then we get into a room and it's like, you know, by the third song, it sounds like useless ID. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's something nice to have. So that was like, you guys uh, all came in did that session and then the next day started your tour with no effects. Yeah. That was oh. a fun time. Uh, yeah, that was a fun tour as well. I mean, there was some, some fun, funny, funny things there, like going into Canada and coming out of Canada. <laughs> but, um, overall that, that was, that was a great tour and, you know, uh, hung out with Mike as well. So that, that sort of continued to help build the relationship with Mike. Cause, uh, we, we released State is Burning and he absolutely loved it. Like I sent him like a rough mix or the mix. And I think one of the guys was like, ah, maybe, maybe we should wait till we have a master. And I'm like, no, it doesn't matter. Whatever happens. So we sent it to him and he got back to me like the same night. It's like I'd be honored to release this great record, something like that in the email. So yeah, yeah, so I, yeah uh, so we got the tour eventually. Yeah, that was a, uh... Definitely the record that, you know, after that session and I really got to know what Useless ID was about, um, man, I just, I fell in love with that CD. I, I want to say, uh, you know, songs like Stopwatch, Borrowed Time, you know, Land of Idiocracy, all the songs that you did in the session, you know, plus a few more are just, yeah, I just, they were just so catchy. I could not stop listening to it. Um, Thank you. So you recorded... Did you record with Bill on that or just at the blasting room? No, we recorded with Bill and Jason and Andrew. <laughs> so did, did he help produce and that? Chris. Or did, you, did he, uh, did they kind of all team up to help produce that? Yeah. Yeah. Just... That in the blasting room, they have like this multi, uh, facilitated studio mm -hmm. where, you know, while, let's say the drum, uh, well, Gideon at the time, he was the drummer. So while he was tracking drums, I'd be on bass in the other room and they take a break from drums. Okay, let's start the guitar because I finished a bass take and we're flying the bass take to the other room. So, you know, you're oh. just kind of like working around everything. And eventually you take, a bear, you take a little break, you sit with Bill for lunch, you go over some lyrics, you go over some ideas. So yeah, it's all like very inspiring. I've uh, Every time I've been at the blasting room, it's like, uh, uh, I'm, I'm like always so stoked. I'm like, there's going to be such a wonderful two, two and a half weeks of my life. Cause you know, you're making a record mm -hmm. and then uh, eventually the label gets it and then it's out and everyone's excited. And then, you know, so that, that, that's my experience from being at the blasting room. It's become like a thing of the band. I've heard a, a lot of people say that um, Bill's a little intimidating in the studio. Um, oh, no. No, you know, not experienced I, I mean, all. I think the first time uh, we, we made an album with Bill was kind of like, kind of like a bit weird, I guess, just kind of getting around his personality because Bill is so odd in a way, but in, in a very, um, in a very wonderful way. I, I don't mean it in a bad way. I mean it in a way that like <laughs> once you get an idea of, of, the way Bill works and the way his personality works, you're, you're kind of like, uh, charmed by it. You're like, you see Bill and then you're like, uh, he, he's like, uh, your, your big papa. <laughs> I don't know how yeah. to explain it. No. Yeah. Just like w when we played the song, when we played the, we played a few shows with descendants last summer and I was just so, I, I just saw Bill and, uh, and he's like, do you have any songs? Do you have any new songs? And I'm like, no, but I'm going to write some new songs because I want to come back to the Blaster Group. So instantly I was inspired, <laughs> you know? That, that's how it is with Bill because you, you, see, you see the man, he, he's like, he, other, than a, other than a friend and other than family, Bill is a legend. He, I, I don't know many people yeah. that could say, you know, when we were in Black Flag, we used to do that, you know? Yeah, 
Yeah, I, don't, no. I don't know people at Black Flag. I know Bill. So there's a there's only a few people in punk that I would just be completely starstruck by, and it would just be really hard to uh, not hard, but I would just. It would be hard to get over the fact that you're talking with Bill, you know, from Descendants and yeah. from Black Flag and, um, you know, watching the Descendants documentary, you know, that a lot yeah. of people I, I loved band, it more the second time, the yeah. second time around. I, I was just like, oh, so good. Yeah. I. It's uh, It's just really cool to, you know, be able to work with, you know, some of the people you've been inspired by and been listening to, you know, most of your life. Yeah. So. That's pretty amazing. Well, cool. Well, um, did you uh, have any uh, brand new songs that you've been working on lately? Or uh, what yeah. have you been up to, like, you know, right at the moment in quarantine? Um, I'm okay. I, I've been doing like these certain recordings that uh, you'll hear about them soon. <laughs> yeah. So I, I guess you could call it demos. I'm, I'm trying a, a bunch of new things. So. I, I, it's, it's interesting. I thought I haven't written anything in this whole time in quarantine, but mm -hmm. I, I try to grab a guitar at certain points in the day and sit, sit with it for like, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes, just play something and, or, or hum to the voice memo. So I realized I had a bunch of voice memos. So last week I went over them and there were like, I don't know, 30 song ideas that I thought that were great. That was like, wow. Oh my God, this could be a good song. This could be a good song. Mm -hmm. So I guess, I have some material for another record, but I don't know whose record. <laughs> so it's just, just random. Kind of yeah, like just solos. random. I mean, there's punk songs, but there's also like very quiet finger picking acoustic songs. Mm -hmm. And with Tommy and June, I mentioned it before. I think we have the bulk of the material for the next album whenever we'll do it. So I'd like to think that I'm kind of ahead of my game. So yeah. now, now I just got to sit on my ass and write some lyrics. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so what's the what's the next uh, big move? So like after COVID is over, um, you know, what do you think you're gonna focus on the most? Oh, I'm gonna focus on Paula, my girlfriend. I, I got we yeah. gotta spend time with each other. Totally. Uh, so we we got uh, we got some plans we we want to do, and eventually, I guess I'll uh, find myself in the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, with the decomposers and uh, plowing forward cool right on yeah that'll be exciting i'm um stoked to uh you know obviously for all this to kind of blow over and everybody get back to normal life but just to kind of see what uh all this you know time in lockdown is going to do when people are you know finally able to uh yeah. to you know so all this time people are in lockdown people are writing recording making plans and then as soon as we're back yeah for, for me it was kind of hard <laughs> to like write and record and like because because i've just been worried for two months about uh, you know seeing seeing my girlfriend uh, yeah. that she's she was in the one of the worst places of uh, corona now yeah. now it's not like that i think in the u.s it's 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 pretty pretty rough right um you know it's for me, um, I had to stop looking at the updates because yeah. I, I, I got this uh, update on uh, an app on my phone and, and it would give me updates every day and, and I would see the numbers just getting higher and higher, the deaths, the uh, people yeah, yeah. recovered and people sick. And it's just, I was already kind of starting to get into a depression because I'm just kind of isolated. And uh, so I stopped looking at the updates and, you know, who wants to see Trump every day giving mm. speeches and stuff. So I stopped looking at anything regarding the news. And now what I hear is uh, businesses are starting to open up, but I'm, I'm a little skeptical. I'm, I personally still want to kind of just stay low and see what this next surge of businesses opening does because to me, it seems like if people are just going to respread uh, the virus and, and we'll have another wave of, of this. So I truly hope not. Well, at least I, if that too. happens, I, I got to be with my gal and then yeah. I, the world can, I don't know, do, do what it wants. <laughs> I'm yeah. joking. But I, I really hope that I, I, uh, I'm trying to stay as cautious as, as I can. I leave mm -hmm. the house. I'm with a mask. Yeah. I try not to be out for, I try, you know, I, I was supposed to stay in quarantine in the beginning for 14 days. At the end, I stayed 
for like a month. I don't think I left the house. I was like, eh. yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going out. <laughs> so, yeah. It's not really worth the risk, but I think, exactly. what, I think what we're planning on doing is, uh, next month, um, we're going to try to see if we can pull off doing some sessions. And I think we've talked about some precautions that we could take. There's some, um, antibody tests that you can do now to cool. see if you've had COVID or if you're, you know, like there's a lot more testing available to the public now and, you know, hopefully we can make something work and get back to uh, business next month. Cause man, I am just like, I'm losing it here. I just have, uh, yeah. I have working out and, you know, I got my screen press uh, here and, you know, so I can work and do a couple things, but, uh, you know, without having new sessions or, um, you know, be able to work with other musicians, it's just, uh, getting a little stir crazy over here. Yeah. Yeah. I know what you mean. I, I met Corey last week, so that was fun. I haven't seen him in like ages. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, Corey, the drummer of uh, useless IB. Oh yeah. 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 And spit. Uh, oh, totally. Yeah. Corey's yeah. awesome, man. That guy yeah, yeah, so he's great. So is, is Spit the band that he uh, he play, oh, plays drums with you, like the hardcore band? But he also yeah, sings, yeah, yeah. He sings for a hardcore. He sings in Kids Insane. Yeah, everyone got like a million bands here. Yeah, it's crazy. I, I had no idea he was even a vocalist and, uh, you know, that talented. It's like everybody. Yeah, he, he's one of these people that he's great at what he does. You know, you put him as a singer, he'll ki kill it. Drummer, he'll kill it. So, yeah, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Man, he is, he's amazing. Yeah. Uh, so are you, uh, do you have any, uh, live shows booked coming up or anything that you want to plug, uh, to kind of, kind of give your fans an idea of what's coming up? Um, well, I, they, they could stay tuned on my, uh, music page, yo, Tom dash, uh, no, yo, Tom Ben dash Horin. It's a bit different than my name. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I do shows like, I think like two or three times a week, maybe Two okay. times a week there on Instagram. I do shows on Yotam Ben Harin so they could check it out. And uh, yeah, that's what I've been doing. Awesome. Any uh, merch or anything that you want to? Yeah, I've actually been doing these like lyric canvases. Uh, you see, they're like this big. Yeah. Or there's bigger ones. So uh, I do song, songs that I've written on, in, on them. And uh, so if anyone wants to get a hold of these, they can get in touch with me and we'll, we'll sort it out. <laughs> So awesome. I do that. Uh, I have, some, yeah, I have some CDs, seven inches. If people are into it, yeah, awesome. Well, it was really awesome catching up with you. And uh, yeah, you too. Yeah, and thanks for thanks for being a guest. Um, looking forward to uh, seeing more live streams and uh, for everything to get back to normal. So hopefully we can uh, have you back and have Useless ID back for another session, or maybe Tommy. Tommy and June next time uh, you guys uh, do a little tour to Portland. So for sure. That would be yeah. great. Yeah. Awesome. Well, uh, take care and uh, we'll talk to you soon. All right, buddy. Take care. All right. Onto thank the you. Onto the sun. Onto the sun. Onto the sun. Get it all, 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 all.